Welcome back to CXO Games, where sea levels come to play. I'm your host, Julian Inchinski, joined by Justin Michael. And today's coach is Galaga, CEO and co founder of Aligned. Prior to that, Gal has spent 15 years in the B2B sales game, scaling cutting edge startups from 1 million to 100 million in ARR, with leading companies like Anagog, Site, Sysense, NanoRap, and Bozilla. What are they miss, Gal? Well, sounds about right. <laughs> Great to be here. What's unique about this no webinar webinar? <laughs> no that... webinar, webinar. <laughs> Um, CXOs are playing, debating, and benchmarking their strategies. And we've got Tisha on the show and Warren Zena. Tisha Cable is the CEO and co-founder of C-Model. And Warren Zena is the founder of CRO Collective. I'm going to bring him on in a minute. Both of these amazing leaders were coaches prior on the games. So welcome back. How are you doing, Tisha? I'm doing pretty good. Um, I'm excited to, to be here again. I love this format, so thanks for having me. Yeah. We've got Rebecca Tessitano, our head of community. So for all of you watching, if you have any questions for Gal, just free, message, free to message Rebecca, and we can bring you on the show. You can ask your questions live, or just Rebecca can do it for you. Hey, Warren. I don't know Hello. if you can hear me or not. Yes, we are. <laughs> That's weird. Let me see why my internet is so unstable. It shouldn't be, but hi. It's good to see everybody. And I don't know why my background hey. is different than everybody. Is that supposed to be the case? Is there something I'm not doing correctly? It means you win the game. Okay, see, <laughs> I see that, everybody. Okay. <laughs> hi, good, good game. Usually, usually how it goes. Yeah. Ah, there we go. Thank you. All right, great. Good to see everybody. And thank you so much, uh, Justin and Julia, for inviting me. Um, really appreciate it. It's fun, fun doing these things. It's good to meet everyone. Awesome. Before we transition to the action, we want to thank all of our sponsors, Apollo.io, Aligned, Chili Piper, Outplay, Substrata, Chad Metrics, and Gal. Let's get started. All right. Great. So where do we start with uh, the presentation? Yes, please. Okay. Sounds good. Wonderful. So, um, yeah, so sticking to the format, I'll basically start with uh, 10, or I think it will be probably 13 or 14 minutes of uh, introducing the concept. And then we'll, of course, jump right into the challenge. Uh, really excited to be here. Really, this is one of, uh, this is the topic that uh, we love the most. We talk about a lot. And, uh, um, you know, there's more stats actually that recently came up related to this. So essentially the topic that we're going to talk about is called buyer enablement, um, which is a concept that Gartner coined a few years ago, and is now really highly trending topic. A lot is going on in sales, a lot is going on, especially in, uh, in buying journey, buying experiences, which relate to this and make it uh, a hot thing that a lot of people are talking about. So I'm going to introduce the concept, what is really key, why it is key as we think winning this year and more so in the near future, how to implement it, and then we'll move to the challenge. So um, I'd like to kick things off with just leveling up, uh, leveling the playing field a little bit and kind of a recap of where we are right now. So, you know, everyone will agree, right? These last two years have been crazy. Right? We just had this dr drama all over and dramatic shift from one craziness to another craziness. Uh, one was on the left, let's just do whatever we can to grow, let's go all in, um, hire as fast as we can and not think of the consequences because we'll probably have easily, very easy, it's gonna be easy to just bring more money from VC. And then we had within just a, a month or a few months, uh, this dramatic shift to where we are right now, where we're all trying to think about this crazy new concept called unit of economics and uh, trying to drive efficiency, starting to look at more than just top of the line, 
and uh, trying to basically grow more steadily uh, with the team that we have and ensure that everyone are hitting targets. And while we're all trying to do that, uh, unfortunately, the stats are that uh, most of us are still struggling. So these are this is pavilion. Uh, these are pavilion numbers from a Q1, but I know that not a lot has changed in Q2. Um, and basically, more than 50% of missed targets. And the bottom line is very clear. Uh, everyone can relate to it. I get, I assume uh, sales is just so damn hard right now, right? So in the last years, it's been growing complexity uh, more and more, and it's just simply reached, reached its peak at the moment. So if we analyze this and dive it deeper, we see uh, three key harsh realities that uh, are on everyone's mind at the moment. One, last decade was doubled the number of stakeholders involved in the deal. We have CFOs and CEOs right now uh, as the new uh, step in the buying journey. Uh, it's just so much harder to influence uh, decisions because of budget scrutiny. Uh, one side of it is more stakeholders, but of course the economy, the economy and uh, uncertainty around it. And then the last piece is just more hesitance and surprises that lead to longer sales cycles. So people are just much slower to make decisions. They're doing much deeper evaluations. There's budget cuts, layoffs, priority shifts, buyer confusions, and just general volatility in the market that makes uh, sales cycles longer. So uh, what do we do when everyone are trying to do this in one way or another? Uh, we just double down and trying to improve selling and trying to make everyone more effective. Uh, closing tactics, uh, these discovery tactics, implementing new methodologies, and uh, investing in you know the best way that we can and the little budget that we have with in tools that will either boost rep productivity or help managers forecast better or manage pipeline better, etc. So all of that makes sense. These are all great solutions, but. What we're here to talk about today, and I'd like you all to take a moment really to think about is what if we're making a bigger side of this problem, right? Because yes, we are as sellers experiencing these challenges, but uh, actually these are buyer challenges that are affecting sellers. These are not sales challenges. These are buying challenges. And not a lot of us, you know, we've been talking about these for years, challengers have been talking about buying experience and things like that. that but it's not like the key focus and, and really top of mind for a lot of us, but it's really gone much, much more complex for buyers. And if you think about it, how many hours do you put in, did you put in into a buying journey recently? It wasn't five, it was probably more around 20 or even 50 hours or even more if it's multiple stakeholders. So it's no surprise that when Gartner has looked and researched the buying journey, they say that it looks something like this. And so really the message here uh, for this part is, yes, sales is hard in terms of getting results, but when it comes to the actual volume and the complexity of activities, buying is actually even harder. Okay, so we try to execute a linear process, uh, go and do discovery and think that the buyer is doing problem identification and uh, supplier selection in a linear way, but the reality is that they're going back and forth between a lot of different steps. Uh, if we take around five hours to close an SMB deal, 20 or 100 to close an enterprise deal, they do it two, three times with additional vendors, plus offline research, making sense of the noise, internal meetings, running POC, thinking about the project, fighting for consensus, budget, politics, all of that on top of doing their day to day job. Okay, Remind, uh, a, the reminder buying is, buyer is not a uh, a role unless you're performing. So why does all of this happen is because over time, the markets are changing and that that actually on the left is what uh, surprised us the most. You would think that there, is an, there was that level of increase in the, in the number of vendors in the market, but actually the reality is the number of categories. Okay, AI is a category. We have 21% increase in two years in category. AI is just what? Okay, probably it's split into multiple. But think about how much complexity is in understanding and figure, figure, figuring things out. Then also the accessibility, the amount of information, webinars, 
or no webinars, webinars, uh, and areas to learn from uh, exist, and just buyers are, are overwhelmed. Okay, so another question that I want you to think about for a second is with all of that on your mind, why would you invest more than a bare minimum with a seller? Okay, you have all these tasks and all these things, all that complexity, which is exactly why, okay, we're seeing another issue uh, when we look at the buyer side, which is not only buying is complex, we actually shifted into what we call uh, a buyer-led era at line. Uh, which then let's let's look at the stats behind this. Why we make such a bold claim? Uh, one, Gartner found that out of all of that complex journey and all of the jobs to be done for the buyer, with you as a single vendor in a competitive scenario, you get only five percent. I repeat again, five percent of the buyer's time. Five percent window to influence one buyer or multiple buyers to go and face these additional five, six, seven, eight, ten, twenty 20 buyers and sell internally, okay? Why does that happen? Buyers don't want the average selling experience, so they do it alone. They are empowered to self-research, so they do that. And look at the right-hand side, and this stat is new. This was two months ago. I was quoting, I was putting here 43% to purchase self-serve. This has now gone up, this is new research, uh, and we updated our deck this week. 75% prefer to not speak with the seller at all. Okay, so what does all that mean? Bottom line, selling happens on the buying side. It happens behind the scenes. It happens when you're not there to influence it most of the time. So with that reality, um, What's the conclusion? The conclusion is that yes, selling is complex, but it's actually buying complex that it kills deals. And the solution is maybe very close to us uh, beyond focusing on ourselves. And, and I think like what actually led us to found our company is that aha moment, the top sellers have been doing this for years. The top 1% really are, are experts not at selling, they're experts at creating uh, um, very good buying journey. So in this area, if you're everyone, and not only top sellers, if all sellers are not extremely good and focused at enabling buyers to sell internally while they are not there and reducing friction throughout the entire buying journey, you're just not losing, you're redundant. Why would you be there in the process? You're just one source of information once in a while and they'll go and make their own decision and you won't end up in jail like this guy, but, uh, um, you know, the implications are, of course, uh, dramatic. So if you look at these implications, selling to your buyers and trying to just move the deal and bring information and, and pitch basically feels like banging your head against the wall. You get ghosted and single-threaded because buyers don't feel that you're helping. Why would they work with you and introduce you to others if you're not really helpful? You get smaller deals, actually 3X smaller, according to Gartner. You lose to no, uh, no decision and that option seems easier and you lose the competitors that actually made the journey easy. So really the message here behind the concept of buyer enablement is very simple. Yesterday you could get away with doing what's on the left, selling to a buyer, pushing, using sales tactics, focusing on yourself, throwing a lot of information, not thinking about the consequences too much. And these days are gone. Uh, today, you have to focus on ensuring that all reps can do what these top 1% have been doing for years. And buyer enablement essentially is an organizational focus, a strategy to make it easy for all buyers to buy across sales skills, content, tools, and processes. So if we look at a few examples here before we move to the challenge, um, hmm. so... Uh, a few areas where this applies um, is sales skills, content, tools, and processes. So let's look at a few skills. So essentially, of course, throughout the entire journey, as far as much as we coach our sellers to just reduce friction, <clears throat> and it can happen across the entire sales process, then the better. But there are a few key skills here. One of them is, of course, multi-threading. Uh, so a lot of us look at multi-threading as a way to influence, but it's really a way to help and bring support to the champion. 
instead of them trying to do everything alone, having multiple people on your side and multiple people on the buying side is important. So with our digital sales rooms, we actually analyzed and saw that on SMB deals and overall, okay, on deals that are 68% more stakeholders than what sellers thought they were, that they had involved in their deals. Uh, when we compare digital sales room deals and, uh, and surveys and, uh, and in SMB deals, it's actually double. So 6.3 stakeholders on average in SMB deals means that even SMB deals, uh, SMB reps need to learn the uh, enterprise seller regional and originally an enterprise seller skill. Second thing, of course, is obvious, uh, just learning to do champion development, uh, and champion enablement. So to find a champion, develop a champion, to sell for you while you're not there because of all the stats we talked about earlier, it just must have skill for all uh, sellers today. How to guide champions, how to buy, who to look in, how to help them, support them, bring them the resources and work with them um, as your internal ambassador um, to bring the deal. Another element is, is uh, what we talked about, content. Um, so Gartner said that only 20% of content that vendors use really enable buyers. Uh, so of course there's the internal facing content like scripts and cheat sheets. Of course that that helps buyers in some way, but that's seller focused. But even the buyer focused like Dex or even a lot of the case studies that are out there are just these generic marketing things that were prepared and 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 are a lot of buyers don't use well. So what does it look like having your content focused on on buyer enablement uh, more ready to enable buyers? It means creating custom decks, creating decks for an executive review, creating decks for um, a POC summary, okay? creating templates for a lot of other scenarios. It means creating buying tools like calculators, benchmark data, uh, true competitive comparisons, a product industry resources, requirement checklists, and uh, diagnostic tools. And last piece, I won't go into processes too much. Uh, so tools. Uh, so there are, there are just very few options around tools since the buyer enablement concept is new. Um, one of them, one of the things that really is, uh, Gartner is talking about a lot and is leading the way behind this is uh, digital sales room. Uh, so essentially digital sales room is a collaborative space between you and the buyer or the customer for hotel, which allows you to create a more repeatable and more effective journey for both sides. All content, conversations, key processes, are shared with stakeholders, everyone enter into that space that can help champion sell you internally and uh, just create a better experience. So that's one of the products that uh, we offer at Align. And the case study here and, and how something like this could help is Deal, uh, which is today, I think Deal holds the record of the fastest to go from 1 million to 100 million ARR. Uh, so 400 reps or 300, uh, almost throw 400 reps right now are using a line. Um, and the challenges that they have is uh, a lot of emails uh, are the norm, heavy education, content sharing, and really a result of something like this is just getting better engagement uh, with uh, champion, better selling you internally, and all buyers having everything laid out in front of them, all decision supporting materials, better multi-threading, winning more complex deals and measurable, they saw a reduction in sales cycle by 30%. So if we summarize, uh, buyer enablement basically is, is, is that moment where George Constanza realizes the value of shifting focus to helping people, um, which is there uh, and gets that aha moment, that is something that's valuable. Uh, that's essentially how it feels like. Um, so it's about skills, content, tools, sales process, adapting all of these key areas uh, as an organizational focus. And I can say also that we've seen recently um, roles opening up, buyer enablement manager. Um, we've already tracked a few of these roles, so it's definitely a trend that's going to uh, stay. All right, ready for the challenge? Warren, Tisha? Uh, yeah, sure. So this is this is the challenge here. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's the background, and then I'll I'll share the task in a second. So um, getting to this. Uh, so this, for the challenge, um, what we thought about is a certain scenario. So 
try to get into this mind of you're selling, you're somehow a vendor that is getting into this space um, of sales engagement software, right? So outreach Apollo, sales loft, now gone, uh, competing with all of these. Your premium price, um, very differentiated on AI, really doing something that no one else is doing. You're targeting mid-sized tech companies and your challenges are that sales cycles have increased at the evaluation stage, POC trial, um, and buyer drop day rate went up at the decision stage. Okay, you're just getting to the end of the sales cycle and just that's where your drop out is. And, and then the question is, how would you approach solving this internally, levering a buyer enablement strategy? More specifically, what would be your buyer's touch points at these stages and the challenges that they might be experiencing to try to, you know, envision so I took a known category, something you can easily think about uh, on purpose. And then how would you improve the buyer journey and solve these challenges? And specifically, of course, address self-process training, content, and tools. Any questions? No. I'm just looking. Right. Aisha, good to go. Yeah. I think so. Okay. Do you need a few minutes to think about it? Or in Tisha? Yeah, well, no. So how long will we actually have to uh present? Are we just jumping right in? How does this Remind me. Uh, whatever you prefer, and Gal, it's really up to you. Okay. Normally, we give five minutes. Sometimes people just yep. jump right in. So. Yeah, I, five five minutes will be good for me. Amazing. Okay. All right. All right. Yeah. Okay. Sure. I'll take the five. You want me to? Would you like me to keep this on? Yeah, it would be helpful if you could. I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah, sure. sure. Awesome. Um, let's transition into Q&A and Rebecca, feel free to join me and all of you watching as well, um, share your question on our Slack channel. Gal, I'm curious to double down on this buyer enablement concept and reflecting on your journey and building alliance and spending 15 years in sales, scaling companies to 100 million ARR, once again, super impressive. I'm curious, what do you think? Is it a totally new um, way of selling that never happened before and was never relevant before? Or we just you know, didn't name it that way and we're not thinking about it? Yeah, I love that question. Um, so the journey, so the the way that I think we're thinking about this is as follows. So I think for sure uh, there's nothing new about focusing on the buyer. Like there's nothing new about this. Like uh, Challenger sells said a decade ago that I don't remember how much, fifty seven percent or something like that of the buying uh, decision criteria is around. Um, is around buying experience, the sales, seller's experience, right? So this has been preached for a long time. Um, what's different is that it has been preached or it's been preached as a, an, as a small element behind the methodology or is something that sometimes uh, revenue leaders would talk about and how they would coach. Um, but it has not been fully implemented Okay, as a strategy around all of these four different elements, that's that's one way that we're looking at it. Um, secondly, there are now tools that, um, if you look at the sales stack, the sales stack is loaded around everything, but how you work with the buyer. So there's so many things at the top of the funnel, so many things for productivity, for analytics, like everywhere. There's so many solutions. But the actual buying and selling has not changed for a decade. PDFs, Excel, spreadsheets, links. So technology really facilitated a better buying journey. And 
And all this new research by Gartner, uh, so Gartner started talking about this because their thing, and I think so another pivotal moment was COVID and that's where I think Gartner started talking about uh, buyer enablement more. Um, they just said, so they're saying that uh, by 20, 30, 80, or I don't remember the exact stats uh, by where, but 80% of uh, selling will move to digital. Um, so there's just a lot going on, which indicates that we're moving away from the buyer. There's a shift. And we just have to put this as a front, uh, at the front of our strategy, right? And that's, how, that's why you break it down. Let's look at our tools. Let's look at our content. Let's look at our sales process. Let's analyze the sales process every once in a while, ask our buyers about the friction that they're experiencing. Because otherwise, sellers over time will you know, become more and more uh, irrelevant uh, to the journey. Their still matter. Gartner also says that the ones that prefer to self-serve have a higher uh, chance of uh, regret, okay, are more likely to regret. Um, but, uh, but we just need to put more focus on this uh, more than ever. That's, that's the concept. So a long, long answer, but I, I hope it helps clarify. Absolutely. I'm curious if that um, somehow re is related to actually creating a line and what's what's the backstory uh, yeah so it in so it's it's not that uh, we had an apple falling on our head and we said oh buyer right uh we were self-centric at the at the beginning so um i was an advisor initially at the company uh while i was a cro and my co-founder another gal uh, Galvich uh, and Yotam, uh, third co-founder Yotam Sela, they they basically built the company. And and but Gal and I worked together previously at a, at site. And really, what we felt all, all the time, where the initial idea came from, is that um, there's something that the top sellers do, and we were all the time kind of thinking about how do we make all sellers like the the, the top sellers. And what we realized is that what the top sellers do that others don't they're really good at project management product project managing the deal creating a champion doing all of the elements of buyer enablement they're not selling they're really enabling buyers and creating um uh curating a buying experience and that was the difference and then so that's essentially where the idea came from it initially was around we saw that there are some mutual action plans platforms starting to appear but nothing that goes beyond that, that um specific stage of a mutual action plan or job to be done of aligning on next steps and timelines. And so that's where the concept uh, came from. We wanted to make all sellers as the top sellers, as good as the top sellers. And we understood that the way to get that sales effectiveness is actually through the buyer. And also we saw that another thing that we saw is that there's just, it was post COVID um, and Suddenly you have Miro, Figma, and Notion, Slack. Like you have these collaborative workspaces everywhere where you collaborate internally and externally, um, but they're all not for sale. Nothing is purpose built for sale. And we're all getting used to this, these environments that help you collaborate, but there's nothing really, the, the, the selling and buying has not changed as it does before. So we realized that there's a huge gap here in the sales stack that nothing is really addressing. And, um, you know, video, demo experience platforms and digital sales rooms, mutual action plans and onboarding platforms. These are the elements of uh, buyer experience and that's it. Uh, so that's, that's where we double down. Fascinating. I have a lot of questions, but Warren, Tisha, we're out of time. And uh, who's gonna go first? Okay. Um, oh, Warren, were you, did you want to go first? I don't care. Sure. Whatever you want. Whatever, is, whatever you're comfortable with. Want me to go first? Um, I'll go first. Sure. You go ahead. Sure. <laughs> so, so thank, thanks. Um, I, I, you know, this is what I think about this. I, obviously, it's hard to argue the, the validity of the premise. There's no doubt that things have gotten complicated. Uh, the irony is that the reason, one of the main reasons it's gotten complicated is because we've complicated it. Where it's our fault, really. 
you know, we've made the sales process too complicated. We've added too much software. We've added too many layers. We've had too many people to the process. And I'd say B2B, particularly software and SaaS organizations are the most self-centered businesses on the planet. You know, so we care about is our own processes and how we go to market and how we talk to people and how much we sell. And buyers feel that, you know. Um, you know, we're, I'm sure you're all familiar with how often you're being asked to adhere to your company's processes as opposed to their and adhering to your processes, right? So it's insane. That being said, you know, your gal, your, you know, your, your, your initial thought was spot on in that, you know, first of all, I have a question, which is how big is this company in this scenario? Is it like a, what's the AR? Just give me an idea of how big this company is. How many clients do they have? What, what's the revenue? Yeah, I wanted to add that. Um, uh, B stage, B stage company. Yeah, 50 seriously. million in revenues, something like that. I'm just trying to get a number. So I'm trying to get a sense of like what the yeah, success is. Just to even the playing field. Yeah, let's take 50 million now. Okay, yeah. fine, fine, perfect. So then, okay, if they have 50 million in revenues, then there's obviously some things that are working, right? They probably, like you said, they have a couple of people, maybe one person who's really good at this. This isn't a buyer centric thing. This is, in my opinion, this is just knowing how to sell properly. I don't think that I don't think anything you're talking about is new. I think actually what's happened is we forgot what we're supposed to do. You know, selling to people and being, you know, customer centric was always the way you're supposed to sell. And we got away from it because we got so we overcomplicated our businesses. We stopped doing the things that we work that used to work. So it occurs like there's some new problem, but I think it's a degradation of the sales training function in the marketplace that looks like something's different, but it's just, we've stopped doing stuff that just makes sense. So, you know, the way I'd be approaching this particular scenario is um, the first thing as I'd be doing is looking at the people or the person, like I said, who seems to have figured this out. There's probably someone who's just really naturally good at this. You now they're organized and that they have empathy and they have the right sales skills to identify what's going on with customers and they're good at figuring out who's really making decisions and they just know how to do it really well. And a problem with people that are really good at things is many of them don't know why they're good at them. They're just good at them. I have no idea why I was able to read an entire novel out loud to a class when I was three years old. I don't know why. I just couldn't. Okay. Someone said, how did you do that? I, said, I don't know. I just, I, I just know how to do it. So then to trying to re-engineer someone's skills or talents, it's complicated because, you know, they don't really know how to explain it a lot of times. They're thinking like, I don't know, is that what you're supposed to do? So, but you have to do it, right? You, you do have to engineer excellence and then create a process from it and repeat it, okay? So I'd be looking at, Okay, let's break down, and we've done this, right? We've done it all the time, right? People have, the, how many countless videos have you seen of amazingly talented people and people break down like how they do it and they break it down and so you can try to replicate it. Um, you know, American Idol, that was built on that idea, you know? Mm -hmm. so, so I think like engineering a process, but th th underneath this has to first be a training and development exercise that starts all the way with hiring. And that is that your organization is a customer centric organization. We don't hire salespeople. We hire people who solve problems for people, right? We have solution oriented thinking, which is going to disrupt a lot of things, right? Because a lot of things in your scenario, the only reason that they're challenges is, is we've created strains that now become our problem. For example, projections, quarterly earnings, right? You said B round, right? We're gonna eventually have to get a C round. So all those things impact the way that our salespeople are deployed and they're trying to accommodate internal challenges like get the business closed this quarter or we need to reach this certain amount of revenue this quarter so we can get you know, the proper valuation to get the right financing. And those things have nothing to do with customers. And buyers can feel that. Buyers know that when they're on the phone with you that you're chasing something that has nothing to do with them. And the only way that you're gonna get people to not do that is you have to remove those things. And most companies aren't willing to do so because those are the things that drive companies forward. It's like, we've created a paradigm for ourselves. 
that we're stuck in. Okay. So you sort of like talk about this a lot recently, which I think is really a fascinating idea, which is, you know, sort of like the no quota, no commission type thing, right? Where you, you deploy people to the marketplace, you have a genuine product that you want to genuinely help people with, you find people that want it and you get them to buy it and you allow the natural cadence of those things to result in the outcomes. It's risky, obviously, because the way that we've set up our systems and our structures requires quarterly earnings and other things like that that drive these behaviors. How do you build an organization that accommodates the demands of internal growth, but makes customers first? You have to remove and collapse some of those things. So I'd be hiring people who come with an attitude of service, right? And have an understanding of, of, of empathy. Usually the people that are really good at this, they're very good psychologically. They just understand people and the way they think and they understand what motivates people. The best salespeople know that. They can inherently hear what is actually bothering somebody because nobody really makes business decisions. They make personal decisions. They're masked in business decisions, but they're really personal decisions. I don't want to get fired. I want to get promoted. I don't want, I want to save my ass, right? I want mm -hmm. to keep my job. I want to keep my budget. I want to retire early. I want my name in the paper. I want a title. That's why people make decisions. And the process needs to identify those things. If you don't have a baked in sales process that is training people to listen for the reasoning why different stakeholders are making decisions, they're gonna be talking past each other. They're gonna be having two different entire conversations. And the only conversation that matters is what matters to the person that's making the buying decision. And if you don't know what that is, you're not really solving a problem, you're, you're selling now. So the process would include early on, a sales process needs to be able to identify the personal motivation of the buyers. They have to be clear. John Stevenson wants this product because he's got three kids going to college. And if he makes this deal, he'll be able to improve X, Y, Z and get a bonus and whatever. That's what's really motivating this guy. Mm -hmm. Not the efficiency of his business. He doesn't give a shit about that. His boss does maybe, but I can guarantee you, I know this, I work with these people. They don't care about that stuff. They care about the way that those things result in outcomes for themselves. So I would make this almost an entirely new training process of approaching a motivational identification program that trains people how to understand what's really going on behind the buyer's motivations and ensuring that that's front and center and that the product outcome is tied to that. And if you can't do that, you're probably going to miss most opportunities because ultimately something else is going to come along that's going to interest them better because it didn't touch on the thing that matters to the most. I think that's what's missing for most of these processes. Do I think it's another software platform or a chat room? Hold your respect. No. I think that tools that help make these things happen are fine. If they enable people to identify people's motivations better and make those motivations part of the way that they do the customer journey, sure. But I think adding more software into the system is sort of like already what the problem is. If I'm an AI company and I'm selling a newfangled AI platform, and I know that there's various aspects about it that are better or more competitive, or whatever the case may be. We all know that there's no moat around that. Somebody can invent the same technology in three months from now, or they can buy my company or do something differently. What's really gonna make the difference is that the buyers feel that this particular company gets me. They understand what's really behind my thinking about why I make decisions. And I trust that company and I wanna work with them and I wanna use their platforms. How many times? Have you bought a lesser platform because the person you're talking to understands you better? It happens all the time. People don't buy the best thing. They buy the thing that speaks to them. And that's the way that I would organize my sales organization. Around. This is a sales training and a psychological customer centric methodology that would be implemented, evidenced by the ability to identify personal motivations behind buyer segments. I'm complete. Thank you. Love that. Can I, can I ask follow up question on this? Yes. In the format? Yeah. Great. So definitely love all of, all of the approaches uh, that you shared. Um, 
and do, do I share my feedback at the end or I mean to make it while it's fresh in the end yeah <laughs> okay sure at the end I'm so sorry want. okay but uh, oh please Julia it's totally okay whatever whatever, whatever works a <laughs> uh, but just wanted to ask a follow-up question on that like specifically in um for the challenge here for this company uh evaluation stage um getting longer and decision stage dropout how would you go and approach uh, solving this so i definitely understand mean, the high level you, you mean yeah. longer longer decision making processes how would you go and now tackle this you're now you're now you're now facing this challenge in in these two areas in the sales process how would you go and and, and solve it using well, I think when like, looking at things with tools with content that you would change sales process changes skills that you would coach the aes Again, like I, I think all these things somewhat fall underneath what I'm saying and that they're intuitive, right? So let, let's say, for example, okay. like to your question, right? Let's say, for example, you're saying that, that I identify the fact that, you know, we, again, it goes back to my point. What's a long sales cycle? I mean, what, who am I to say that a process is long? It's their sales process, isn't it? It's their timeline. It's not mine, right? So what I'm saying is like, if you're telling me that, oh my God, it's going to take such a long time. Okay, well then that's the customer's desire. They need to have a long time to think about things. Why should I motivate somebody to think about something faster? I mean, that's exactly how I'd be approaching this, right? And I'm saying like the questions with all due respect that come at a sales skill like this are all predicated on our problems. Wow, that's a really long sales cycle. Says who? That's how long they need to make this decision. Okay, so that's how long this client's going to take. So am I saying you take a sort of a laissez-faire approach to this to just let people make decisions when they want to? Yes, because you know they're going to make the decision when they want to anyway. How much can you really speed up somebody's um, sales process? How much? Not much. They still make the decision when they're going to make the decision. All you have to do is find out what it is that's missing, right? So the process would include, all right, so is it because you don't have enough understanding of our product? Is it a product issue? Is there a question about our effectiveness? Is it because you want to understand like how long it takes to implement it? Do you understand what how long it takes to onboard people? I mean, these are all very pragmatic questions you could address, right? I mean, you might be able to shorten some of those things, right? But I'd be asking specific questions about this. And I, if you train your salespeople properly, You'd be able to have a culture where your salespeople come back and say, based on the way that I've identified this customer, this is how long they need to buy this product. And then we align ourselves around that timeline, as opposed to someone saying, I need you to make that go faster. Big mistake. Big mistake. So I do think that the process needs to adhere to those things more than what we do today. Right? Okay. And uh, so, so I think that that's part of it is changing the way salespeople go to market. And sure, Gal, I mean, if a customer says, you know, I need to present this to my board tomorrow, then of course you'd make them a custom presentation for that, that board presentation, because it has to be something that adheres to their specific situations and their specific needs. And you ask those questions and you build that thing, but that's, that should be, maybe I'm naive, but that, that should be standard practice if someone asks you for something. You want to know how it's going to serve them specifically and you make it for them that way. Right. And I just, yeah. honestly, I just don't, I don't, I'm not being somewhat necessarily contrarian here. I'm saying that I don't think companies think this way enough. I think they just toss stuff out when they're asked for it or they're told, get that done faster. That's not, it's not good enough. As soon as you do that, the buyer feels that they're like, well, hold on a second. Why are you rushing me? Okay, great. So, yeah, love that. I'll hold on the feedback to just keep everything uh, okay. uh, together great. at the end. Um, but yeah, great perspective. Love the, there a lot of uh, preaching here. It looks like this is uh, uh, a lot of concepts that you deeply believe in. And, uh, and I, I love that. Uh, a lot of great insights here. Great. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Sure. Okay, so I think for me, um, I think internally it starts with the sort of what's the evidence uh, tell us. And so my first set of evidence on the first issue 
which is why is the sales cycle actually increasing at the evaluation stage? And so my goal there would be to ensure uh, that I can confirm that it's a choices issue, right? And uh, because it may be a market issue. So one of the two is probably, uh, I'm making my assumptions based on what I find in that analysis of why uh, the sales cycle is increasing, then that will determine what kind of information I would wanna put in front of the, the customer. So if, if the case is that they've, they've really got a, a, a market issue, then perhaps there's some market intelligence nuggets that we can utilize uh, in content, right? There's something that I can tell them that then makes them much more comfortable with making this choice uh, using market intelligence. My second option, if let's say that we found that it really is that they've got lots of choices, there's so much information out there, then it becomes helping them to narrow that down by focusing on specifically what's relevant. Right, so just like we would in the case of any other type of data, right? How do I tell them what's relevant to them making this decision that might be available to them uh, in the world of choices that they have? And so I think of those as sort of content related uh, elements that, that we could put forth and share with them. And I think of those as things that I would also make specific to their sized company, right? These are, this is based on the type of company uh, that you are maybe even go down to um, uh, location. I mean, there's a lot of ways to sort of uh, make it a, a very narrow uh, set of information I provide. On the one that's around the the pain, I'm actually I, I share something with Warren here in that the uh, the I mean, at the decision level where there's a challenge, I think a focus on the pain is increasingly important. What does this actually feel like? to a human being to experience the thing that made them start looking for an answer, right? And really digging in and honing on that pain and giving them information to support, number one, making sure they understand you understand the pain, right? So my sellers need to know how to talk to customers about what they feel, because it is a feeling that drives the purchase. Warren is 100% right. They buy the thing. It might not be the most superior solution, but I feel like it solves my problem. So that's something I, I wholeheartedly agree that anchoring on that pain is extremely important. How to do that, how to find those specific challenges, unfortunately, it either requires more conversation, right? So you've either got to be a super active listener when you have the opportunity to talk to the customer, or you're going to spend some time uh, following them around. Right. That means what are they talking about on LinkedIn? What are they talking about on Twitter? I mean, I'm, I'm using these as examples. Um, what are they writing about uh, if they're C-levels and they actually are thought leaders in any space? Just you, there's got to be some sort of way to identify the feeling. And then there's other market research, right, that'll tell you whether or not, you know what the, the common pains are in customers. What are the last few things that they purchased or bought? Um, so maybe there's some uh, uh, ABM type of uh, methodology that you put in place, right? I, I'm going to go talk to people at multiple layers in the company so I can understand what the true pain is there, right? Now, of course, all of that depends on, you know, how much of an investment <laughs> you're making uh, in the sale, right? If, you're, if your company is a $50 million a year ARR company, then you're probably, um, you know, you're looking at $100,000 deals. So you can make an investment and in kind of going up and through. Smaller companies wouldn't be able to invest the legwork in doing uh, what I just uh, described and which would, they would need much more automated ways of getting that information. So I, I think just at the highest level, those are the two ways that I would start to do that. So it would be first starting with some level of analysis to understand and then um, preparing the right content to share. Uh, and then the second one is uh, really making sure we understand the pains of the customer and then using our, our tools uh, to communicate that understanding to the customer. And that's, that's where I'd go. What do you think, Gal? Yeah, well, I, I lo love like both both of these answers are are great and are true, um, and you know it's it's really great that everyone can hear them. And I think they're you have you both have like different angles. Warren is uh, is very deep in uh, uh, Warren's kind of approach. He's very deep in uh, in in philosophy of selling, and 
uh, going back to fundamentals and Felicia, I, I love how you approach this in a more methodological way. Uh, so I think kind of specifically going uh, one by one to Warren, like I definitely agree, would love uh, looking at the seller um, that has figured it out, that's that brilliant. Uh, just looking at the top seller and, and trying to understand what's working there. That's, that's actually a methodological approach and the right kind of uh, good point to start. Um, overall, I agree, like as organizations, we're so much focused on ourselves and that's causing some of these behaviors. Uh, hiring people that get things psychologically and, um, and adapting the sales process. And I, I think what you said about uh, creating a training for understanding buyers, I think that's, that's definitely a move a process change that buyer enablement focus and a buyer enablement manager, if you bring one into the organization, would go and do that. Not only closing tactics, uh, tactics, but let's just we're doing right now hundreds of buyer interviews. Um, we've been doing this for uh, uh, things we found at the company, and and these are just golden golden opportunities. Not only our buyers, like our buyers, of course, but also uh, generally buyers to understand the market. And this is this is just so it's priceless. Um, and bringing that information to sellers definitely can solve a lot of these challenges. What I was missing a little bit on on your side um, is more kind of practical action for these specific challenges. So there's a gap here. There's a gap there. Yes, definitely the high level things would help. But how would you go and deeply tackle? Um, and investigate these areas and what would be potential solutions. Um, I would, uh, that's what I was missing a little bit. Um, so, and, and you said there's no solution to a faster decision process. Uh, so yes, in general, you don't want to push, you don't want to have, a, I think that the culture, a sales culture, and I've seen that in the past, that all about pushing and, and that just creates bad customer relationships, um, bad, Sales experience in general lead to churn. Um, I don't think that's healthy to push the boundaries. But if if the sales cycle has increased, and you can go and analyze what friction is there, and have a conversation with the buyer in an interview, and see, okay, there's friction here, there's friction there. The POC process takes time because uh, we're we just overcomplicated it. To your point earlier, then you can go and just make the process changes or implement some tools, implement uh, some content pieces that will help them go through the POC faster, maybe build the POC page. Like that's what I was missing, more of this methodological uh, approach to this. Mm -hmm. uh, and then Tisha, um, just, I, I, love, I love that the deep growth was more uh, methodological. Analysis of what's missing, market issue, process, love that. Uh, content related elements that fit these specific stages and uh, and decision dropouts definitely like that would be an understanding of pain um, for sure absolutely that would be my first hypothesis as well uh, and talking to people on the buyer side uh, that's great what I was uh, missing is you know you went down the path of a decision dropout potentially being pain, but, uh, uh, and that's definitely a way to coach AE to be more buyer focused. Uh, but uh, on the context of buyer enablement, if, if your champion is failing so many times in decision, it's probably things that you could do better to coach a champion. Uh, so definitely implementing tools that could drive better champion enablement, uh, business case like, for example, coaching the AEs and skills and how to, uh, build a business case, uh, what's the framework for that, things like that. Uh, I would grow more kind of in this direction um, with that answer. Um, yeah, so we really love both. Uh, I'm, more, I'm more of a process guy, methodology guy, so I would actually go with uh, Tisha um, as the winner. But, uh, but yeah, overall, really, really great, great answers here. Great teaching. Congratulations, Tisha. Such a close match, Warren. As you know, no there, there are no congratulations, answers. Tisha. No, of course Thank not. You. Thank you so much for letting me do this, and I hope it was uh, helpful. And Tisha, congratulations. By the way, Tisha, your logo and my logo look almost exactly like a gentleman, right? Is that right? 
Yeah, almost identical. <laughs> Congratulations. Good choice. Nice. Oh, thank you. I had no idea. So. Yeah. <laughs> wow. yeah. Thank you. Wow. But uh, thank you, Gal. Appreciate the feedback. It was helpful. Very nice. And thanks for letting me uh, participate. Yeah. Thank well, you. Thank you both. Everyone, please stick around. We're going to do a demo of Aligned. And that's sure. awesome. Um, Warren, if you have time, if you can stick around, it's always cool to kind of have um, the competitors or contestants, as it were, you know, listening in for practical applications of the software. Um, but if you mm -hmm. can't, that's fine too. Respect the time. Sure. Um, question that we got from the audience, just because there's a lot of tech stack here. Um, Gall, how does how does it link in with like sequencers and other tech stacks? Because like, you know, the pushbacks, like we don't want another tech tool. How have you integrated it? Yeah. Yeah, it's full bi-directionally to like everything. Uh, so customer facing, and I'll, I'll show it right now in the demo. So customer facing, the goal we have outreach, sales loft, gong, big yard, loom, like uh, everything there that you use and share with the customer, a call recording, a calendly, or a big or a, a sales loft calendar, outreach calendar, gong integration, all the things that are customer facing that you share. Uh, are embedded there in one place. So instead of having a lot of different tabs with a lot of links, uh, uh, it's all there. And then of course the holy grail, which is the CRM, everything is bi-directionally synced. So it's not, uh, so you can essentially even do the mutual action plan from the CRM and it will populate an update in the room. Um, everything that you do in there. So the, the digital sales room essentially does not replace 100% an email, but it, it's just an interface instead of the email. A lot of times the follow-up that you do, instead of sending an attachment and another email and another email and going into the spreadsheet and updating something in the mutual action plan, you just go into the room. You have email and you have the room and you have your CRM. These are like the, the key things. Uh, meet model, right? But uh, yeah, to be seen in a second. That's helpful. I don't want to steal your thunder, but that's just what I was thinking. I live in the tech stack land. I might know someone who wrote a book about that. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Are we good to go? Yep. Yeah, let's do it. All right. Let's do it. Okay. So, um, yeah, so I, may, I gave already a brief introduction to this, so I think it could be uh, easier and I'll just dive right into the platform in a second, but just to kind of, again, set the, the ground into what we're talking about. Uh, so essentially, you know, let's start with the, tail, with the tech stack. So uh, the goal of a digital sales room, right, and the need for a digital sales room is, of course, all coming from the need for, um, oh, sorry. My screen here disappeared for a second. Yeah, so it's all basically coming from everything we talked about. Buyer enablement, helping buyers buy, buying being really the focus. Um, and essentially, uh, one of the other key parts is that we talked about the bloated sales stack. So nothing is really addressing head-on uh, deal complexity. We have so many things for rep productivity, for management. Uh, uh, but nothing is really, and we have at the top of the funnel, a lot of different tools. Uh, sorry if I didn't mention, there are so many uh, tools there. Uh, didn't mean to pick a winner or something like that, but yeah, but at the top of the funnel, we have all of that. But then when we look at the mid funnel, we're actually, things have not changed for 30 years. We're using email, we're using links and attachments, we're using spreadsheets. Um, and the experience really is for the buyer, you have a champion that's trying to build a business case, make sense out of things. You have multiple uh, people being looped in at various stages of decision-making process uh, and the evaluation process. And everyone needs to take all of these attachments, uh, email 17 with pricing, even email, email 20 and even 20, email 25 with another revised pricing. And all that are a lot of different pieces of uh, information um, that are just everywhere. And so that buyer or buying group that needs to basically make sense of all of that information is having a hard time, things get lost. And definitely when we're looking at something like a spreadsheet, it's not helping much to drive effective mutual action plan without DRM integration and without uh, being more than a 
the non-friendly spreadsheet. And everything is not really very much analyzed. You just know that someone opened an attachment. So in short, really digital sales room solves all of that and more. Uh, so it's a collaborative space between you and your buyer where it helps to drive for the leadership repetitiveness in the sales process execution. And for sellers, it's uh, like one of the main only and only things that can really help execute the deal, really go through the deal in a better, in a more effective way in buyer facing. So instead of all of that juggling multiple email threads, links, attachments, and tools, we have all resources in one place and you share them throughout the sales process, keep them there, mutual action plans embedded there on a robust, deep mutual action plan platform, key discussions with the customer and analytics on top of that. So everyone can stay on top of next steps, timelines, stakeholders, always have all of the materials in front of them and uh, you can analyze buying risk and intent. It's really the key value propositions for a digital sales room in general, um, regardless of the line or not, um, is to simplify and better influence decisions. It's about bringing the tool that the champion can use to sell you internally with having all of the resources and collaboration in one place. It's uh, a tool to do multi-threading better because instead of having an email that's forwarded internally, you now, the CFO right now enters the room and all the other stakeholders, they enter the room. They don't get your forwarded email. So you get an alert for someone you enter and you can go and reach out to them. You, you, you discover these hidden eight stakeholders using a tool like Align. Uh, keep the process on track and control with a mutual action plan. Uh, identify risk and intent uh, throughout the sales process to, to drive actionable uh, moves uh, and decisions. And lastly, standardized selling with templates. So that's the concept. Um, and I'm going to go through these uh, different points really in a second. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to sell to you guys. Are you ready, Julia and Justin? Sure. Um, what about doing it to Warren? Go. <laughs> uh, yeah, I didn't uh, uh, build a room for that. It's ah, quick and easy to build one, but uh, yeah, just uh, I, I can sell to one yeah, later. <laughs> awesome, let's do it. Yeah, for sure. So it's, you know, you don't have to buy eventually, right? It's just uh, just as an example. Uh, so let's start with really how it works and focus on how you can simplify and better influence decisions. So I'm right now in a room, it took me, you know, a minute or two to build from a template. It can even be automatically created whenever you create a new opportunity. And this is right now when I start building the sales process. So this is where I continue to follow up and make the buying journey easier and gain more control. Um, so there are multiple elements here. So in the preview, I can go and see what the buyer sees. So this is essentially what you would see if I would be in fact selling hype cycle, uh, minus of course analytics and menu stuff like that. So start with uh, one place you can have message, a partnership message sent out. Uh, you can even have video messages embedded into this um, a, as a welcome video message. Um, for example, when I'll share this, so this will be immediately after an intro call, and then you continuously build this throughout the sales process. So post intro call, I would go and organize typically a few of these high level things. This is our sales process. Uh, this is how we typically do it, gives you some clarity. And of course, as we build it, as we as the deal progresses, we can actually build a full mutual action plan. Uh, another uh, thing that helps to give trust and uh, also with multi-threading is showcasing your team. So you can do both your team and the buyer team. And you know, in the more complex projects, these are all the different people involved, their roles, contact details, all in one place. And of course, a few of the things that you would share post demo. So post demo, you would do a big email with here are a lot of links of uh, items that you asked for me. So already you start organizing the process. Um, and of course, there's going to be more things throughout the sales process. So it's already making it easier. So that, that's essentially just the basic concept of it, the way that it would work. So uh, Julia, let's say I'm uh, sending this to you. I think I already, yeah, I think I already have you here. Um, so I would either go and do this, okay? And just add you like that and you would get an invite. 
Uh, or I can go and copy the link and send it to you by email. So I ended the first call. Hey, Julia, it was great meeting you. As promised, instead of me sharing with you a lot of different emails and attachments and links, organize everything for you in one place, you can comment and everything there. And as for our next step, I sent an invite to this day. Here's the link, right? That's another, another option. A, another thing that I can do, and or maybe I can do this and then do another ping in a few days because you asked for another item, I can go and move into edit mode, uh, which will show more things that I have pre-built in my template. And let's say you told me that you wanted to also look at uh, testimonials after the first call to show others or to do a little bit of a go, no go, if we wanna move forward to another step or not, then I'll go and un unhide it from here. And I'll go and say, hey, Oh yeah, so, um, okay, here are a few testimonials that we talked about, okay? So really no much behavioral change where everything we're doing links to email. So right now I can do the ping from here, which brings you here, right? When you look at the content and then I get the analytics, that's the rationale behind trying to do that ping and follow up from here. But I could also have just uh, clicked on the share button. If you prefer the old fashion, just sending another email away, um, you could do that and I can copy that, send it over to you and then just say, hey, here's what we talked about. And you, know, um, and you will go here and write thank you, for example. So that's the basic concept of a digital sales room, how it works, interactions, everything keeps going here. So it's not for all emails, all follow-ups, but it really is for the key parts of the conversation. Okay, moving now into another element. We talked about multi-threading and to improving visibility into deals to identify read intent and to allow you to sell smarter. A, so that element uh, is happens where you right now, Julia, uh, you enter the room, you invite Justin, you invite uh, Rebecca, you invite more people. They started writing, they started to look at things, the sales process progresses, and then there's analytics on the room. So I'll take another room, which is uh, just, I know that we have activity on. We use this also for partnerships, for events, for things like that uh, internally. And let's look at analytics. So every time that there's an interaction in this room, you get an alert, okay? So Justin, Julia, you would, you would get an alert when uh, someone enters a room that you send someone and you get the immediate context that someone is in, there's something that's going on. Um, and so you already get a sense of what's going on in the, in the deal, okay? Uh, and let's start with the first thing. Uh, uh, um, multi-threading. So one of the key things that a digital sales room allows you to do is to identify stakeholders that maybe would just get your email forwarded to you, uh, forwarded to them and would never be involved. So for example, in this, this is a content event uh, that we're hosting and we're now collaborating with all of these people. And I hope I'm not putting them here on the, uh, um, on the stand and who's engaging more than others but I can know exactly who's actually interacting, uh, how much time they're spending. Uh, we made it initially so that everyone can enter, even anonymously, and then, uh, and then they have to identify themselves. But basically I can understand where the people involved, how, how serious they are, uh, how much time they spend. All of this is enriched into the CRM. And now because they're in the room and I have a lot of context, I can go and tell my champion, hey, Notice that your CFO entered uh, the room, the, the space that we're using um, was thinking, you know, typically at this stage, uh, CFO is getting involved. They're typically interested in this. So maybe it would be a good idea to go and bring him on a call and I can bring my VP and we can talk about this, right? So it gives you more context on the people that are involved. You can ask your champion who these people are because they're now in your safe uh, space. We're seeing typically uh, 
10, 8, sometimes deals get even to 220 or even 30 people in this space. Uh, we had deals for some of our customers with 30 hours, as much as 30 hours spending the room. And you can deeply analyze what's going on, who these people are, um, and get the analytics of that. So that's about the multi-threading. Uh, so another element of this is just diving deeper and understanding the, what these people are doing. So I can go and, and really see uh, who's looking at what, for how long. Uh, if it's Dex, I can see that someone has spent uh, two minutes at the competitive comparison slide in the deck. Context, okay, all of this is context. We're now, you know, you, you know that feeling where five people have opened uh, the, your email, one from Arizona, one from New York, and one from uh, California, and wow, you're, wow, amazing. Like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna win this uh, sales manager. Um, uh, put that at commit, and then you get an email that we, they went with another vendor. Um, you just don't have anything. Okay, they opened an attachment. Which, how long, what did they do with it? And that attachment is maybe just one attachment in a final email. So when you get context, we hear things from customers like, I was able to see that the CFO entered the room where we were at waiting for signature stage, and the CFO was spending 30 minutes of the competitive comparison table that we prepared early on in the process. And now, whoa, red flag. I should go and reach out to my champion and try to figure out what's going on and snoop around a little bit and see if my deal is at risk, right? Or just get more context from someone new that's looking at something new and just uh, better personalize your follow-up. So, so that's the concept here. So there's a lot around that intelligence that you could use. Um, these are actionable insights that you could actually use to move the deal, move the needle, uh, move the needle on the deal. Everything is linked again to the CRM, so you could do it there as well. And all of your deals uh, will be here. So on a high level, the managers could get visibility, uh, deal analysis, all of your CRM fields can appear here. But again, as mentioned, especially to all the relevant people in the crowd, everything could be the CR in the CRM and it can be just an interface to engage from and also analyze the um, So that's about that. Moving on to, let's go back to this, although I have it already open. But, uh, so moving on to another concept, which is uh, standardizing the playbook. So as the deal progresses, you continue working on the deal from the digital cell, right? Um, so this is, this is where you continue following up. And a big thing that a lot of sales leaders are looking from a tool like this is to standardize the sales process. Everyone are doing different things. They're presenting proposals in different ways. They have different mutual action plan versions. There's a lot, a lot of uh, different things that they're doing. So one thing that you can do, reps could do is of course just improvise and do things from scratch. So if you look at our builder, then you can go and just build sections and embed things into the sections. We have more than 40 integrations you can just directly integrate into, or you can go from saved sections, which is the standardization. But let's say I just want to build something and I'm following up. So I can go and, uh, and let's say add a video here and say, um, digital sales room uh, video, right? So I could do that. Um, I could, with one click, just add a Google Doc Calendly um, uh, gone call. Another thing that I could do is go and use the library. So if a company doesn't have something like Guru, we would integrate with a, with a Guru and then pull content from there but we also have our own uh, content library, just uh, something to tackle that need as well, if needed. So I could go and um, a sales manager could go and sales enablement standardize all of the content. And okay, that's also here. So that's another part of standardization. Third part of standardization is uh, using section templates. So let's say you have certain ways to show executive summaries, certain ways to show process overviews, 
uh, a lot of different groups of customer feedback that you want to combine together that have certain logic to them, then you could build mini section templates and then just add them to the room like this. Um, and again, standardizing, standardizing, cell drift can bring these details very quickly. And one of the things actually behind this is when, when I was working at a, one of the companies, I always felt I was a sales director and always felt we had, uh, we had like 15 sales directors and every team was doing completely different things. Some were doing like uh, a, a, a document that you would sign on before POC for uh, success criteria. Others were doing these custom decks that were working very well. So you had a lot of siloed different versions of the sales playbook and replicating top performance was very challenging. It was all the time trying to get on more calls with the other sales directors and trying to figure out what, what their top reps are doing. So another thing that we're hearing from this is that um, all when it's really used across the entire rev or revenue organization, then you could really look, go into the top reps, see everyone's deal. It's not another digging into the CRM and finding gold as people are turning this into, into templates and people are having their deals there in, with the way that they execute them in front of you. That's a great way to replicate uh, top performance as well. Um, by the way, if you wanna, if you wanna ask questions and make it more uh, conversational, uh, I've never, never talked too much, so much in the demo than for free, stop me. So good. I have a question, actually, Gal, yes, and please. happy to bring it back to you. Um, so I'm playing around in uh, the product that you shared with me. And uh, uh -huh. what's interesting is the process overview. If you can show yeah. it to everyone here watching. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I have two questions. One, what's the normal reaction of the buyer when they, you know, almost feel like, okay, I'm in your funnel and now I have to go like step-by-step step mm. and on one. But then I scrolled this block and what's beautiful is that last piece that I never seen anywhere else and the value mm, delivered yeah. months, two, three. So you bet basically like almost showing them, that, hey, you're not yeah. a transaction. And the piece that I hate the most when people sell me is that, you know, handoff when you have to transition from like sales team to customer success team and then the experience changes yeah. completely and everyone forgets about exactly. you. So yeah, I love that. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for uh, bringing this up. So I, I think one of the key best practices when we teach about uh, mutual action plans is uh, always do a work back plan from value delivery, not even kick off. A lot of people do this from project start date. So like, what are we talking about here? Not closing a deal. We're talking about you having certain issue, challenge, uh, priority, wanting to be addressed by a certain date. So let's let's do the work back plan from that date. Um, and then it's also easier to drive urgency because it might be, you know, a certain goal that you need to hit by a certain date, and then it might take you a month to implement, a month to get something signed. So. It, it helps to do and put, you know, put that in front of a customer. Um, but it's just also very, you know, buyer centric in the approach. Definitely. Thanks for bringing this up. Justin, I think you had a question. Are you going off mute? Yeah, I was interested in just road mapping for this because there's so many directions of what you could build, yeah. what you could integrate, what you could, where you could take this. I'm curious, like how it applies in different segments from, you know, mid-market to enterprise and then how you could prioritize roadmap because there's so many ways it can kind of octopus out. So it's kind of a double question. Yeah, so you're asking about our roadmap? Yeah, if you're able to share elements and just the process yeah. of roadmapping because it's like the Swiss army knife, right? So it's like, how do you how do you figure out where to go next? And I, I learned and appreciate this from Julia too is just like that product yeah. fit and the product extension. Yeah, I love that. So, you know, definitely in a, uh, with all the people watching and all that, I wouldn't share too many of uh, the strategic things, uh, and there are uh, a lot of them. Uh, and I would say this is the biggest battle. Like, you can go into 
integrations. You can go into more, um, a, like more elements that you can embed, like forms, and and you can go into deepening the collaboration. There are just so many directions, improving analytics, um, mobile interface. There's just so much. Um, so I'm, I'm just, for me personally, I'm just excited to see where, where this category uh, goes in the next few years because there's just so much still to do. It's already getting good, very good results. Um, but there's just uh, definitely so much to do on collaboration, integration, automation, analytics. These are on high level, uh, the different directions. Awesome. And my other questions, you know, you may not want to answer this one, but, you know, GPT, LLMs, all yeah. this, this yeah, nonsense. Sure. <laughs> Flash in the pan, is it yeah. here to stay? Are you going to integrate it? Yeah, hot in, in the oven, definitely. Yeah. A lot cool. of areas that uh, uh, generative AI is going to be integrated. Don't mean to press you on this. I know, I know it's like <laughs> Barbara Walters question you can't answer, but it's just we get so many smart yeah. people on the show. Uh, what else is going on? Uh, Rebecca, Julia, any other questions? Hey, Carl. I'm yeah. part of, like, I'm head of community here. And so I'm yeah. always thinking about community. And one of the big, one of the big things that I am always thinking about is how to get people onto this platform and how to make them mm -hmm. come back over and over again, because that's the first Wonderful. step. Um, yeah. So I'm curious, how how easy is it to log in and to get people to log in for the first time to the platform? Um, and then I just have so many brainstormy ideas about how you could use this even beyond the sales cycle into the you know customer service cycle, creating a yeah. customer service centric um, sales room and enabling and making it really, really sticky. So I think it's a great product and I'm, I'm really excited. About Amazing. It. Thank you so much. So definitely two, two great questions over here. So another part of standardization that actually we didn't cover yet is you can, you'll start from template and a template that of course you would use. So I'm, we're talking about sales all the time. I think it, you know, it's just challenging messaging wise to talk about sales and PS all the time and touch everyone and make everyone happy. So, uh, you know, but, but our customers are, most of them are just either starting with sales and going to CS and, or, or by and vice versa. Uh, definitely fitting up on boarding, uh, creating a better customer experience, uh, faster experience, giving you more visibility during the onboarding, uh, autom automating parts of the onboarding journey. Okay, these are kind of the benefits that typically uh, uh, customer success are looking for. So definitely this is used on the customer success side. Uh, this is just you know, an example of a template and onboarding, onboarding journey and uh, integrating parts of your product dashboard, surveys. There are just a lot, a lot, a lot of things that you can do. And then going to the other question, to the first one, and it's, it's, just, it's just a great one because really we're all the time, our key focus, our product uh, strategies is, Whatever we do, whatever we build, it's not for the seller, it's for the buyer first. Okay, we think we have this printed, like buyer first, buyer first. That's the mentality with developing. So a lot of the traditional early stage of the digital sales room wave, they built this uh, login base. And it was like the UI, the UX, and everything just screamed, this is a sales tool, you're going to be sold here. Okay, and no buyer wants that. So the way that we took this is, you can see here the permissions. I can go and just share this with you. Okay, copy the link, do anyone with the link can enter. And even for prospecting, we have a lot of BDRs using this. Uh, when someone says, hey, send me, send me a one pager. Okay, yeah, great, here, enter here. I'm not putting too much burden and asking for an email and password, uh, it's optional but I'm getting analytics, I can ping you from there um, uh, and all of that. So definitely from a buyer's point of view, this is just instead of a seller sharing with me a deck in a Dropbox or DocSend link, I'm getting a powerful room with a deck with a lot of other things. And then how to loop, and you have the third question, how to loop people in throughout the process. So for example, this is where I continuously so the best sellers that we've seen are just sharing this a lot of times during the call. 
So they end the first call. They say, hey, instead of me bombarding you with a lot of emails back and forth and stuff, like we have this space. I want to show it to you here. I'm going to share things with you here. You don't have to comment, but it will just make easier things for you. It's all going to be organized and streamlined for you. They share it. They then start building the mutual action plan. Okay, they share it and they say, here's how we typically do things. How uh, does your process look like? Uh, going through the POC, okay, that, that's, that's the trial. Should I tag you on here? Um, uh, can you send me this by this day, right? So this, this becomes, when you work with it, even not asynchronically, even during actual calls, you start getting the buyer used to, uh, and we have dozens of recorded buying conversations that sellers, our, our customers send us, of how buyers share this and spread the, uh, to other stakeholders in their organizations, and, they, and then they preach using this. And then another thing is just ongoing, deeper sales process. So building a business case tab, unhiding it, and doing like an executive summary with your champion. This is collaborative. The champion can go in, change this, um, tag you, hey, I changed this, I changed that. You can have uh, an impact calculator being collaborated on with a champion, another tab for, for uh, security, another tab for legal um, proposal, integration into a proposal tools that you can embed here. So basically, you just continuously use this throughout the sales process and it just brings everyone in. It's a long answer, but it, it, I wanted to cover also a few things that they didn't cover yet, uh, which you help me do it seems really powerful and correct me if i'm wrong but it seems really powerful to be able to send one link and say anything yeah. that i send you you can click on this one link and it will be there instead of having to juggle multiple exactly. links multiple products multiple solutions exactly that's what we hear from buyers so the first thing is just look they don't give they they see you as a partner they have everything in front of them the, you're, they're working with you, not you're not selling to them. That's the message that you're saying, sending naturally, natively with this. You're differentiating against the competition. Uh, they, they have less friction, so they'll make faster decisions. They have everything in front of them, so they'll make faster decisions. And you're gaining more control, mutual action plan control, insight control, and, uh, and uh, access to stakeholders. So that, that's uh, basically, and I, I see we're running out of time. I wanted to just wrap up with one more quick thing. Um, so we actually have, so Align is free. Okay, so if anyone is interested, uh, first you can connect with me on, a, on LinkedIn. Uh, I'm active there and happy to help answer questions. Um, and we have a special offer for Hype Cycle. Um, you can just use this promo code and get 10% off. Go to our website, alignedup.com and you can sign up to our free plan. It's real free plan. It's not time needed, no credit card needed. You can just use this with a few deals and, uh, and we're happy to support the process. Thank you so much, Carl. Uh, it's been a pleasure, excellent session. And I, uh, yeah, completely Thanks. sold on the line. How about you, Justin? Definitely sold just uh, sharing the links in our groups and want everybody to take a test drive of this it's key product. Well, Warren, thanks for sticking around. Uh, Warren, what did you think? Yeah, I definitely see the benefits. It's very cool. I, mean, I like it. I like the process. I like the fact that it's all in one place. I certainly know that the sales process can get really sloppy. Um, so it's, it's really slick. And uh, I agree. I'd like to see how it evolves. Um, so thanks for, for sharing that with us. Awesome. Well, we will be back tomorrow. Same bat time, same bat channel. Um, a few Batman fans, uh, 9 a.m. Pacific, noon Eastern. Uh, Gal, what is your favorite quote to end the game? Woo. Yeah. Um, so outside of sales, I think just in the feeding for the time, um, Focus on what you can control. Can control. I think that's that's a mantra to live by, especially in a period like this. Yeah, that's a great one. Um, well, yes. Um, if you'd like to access the archive, 
which is 300 videos at this point and see this show again, just go to hypecycle.com, badge your profile, member of Hype Cycle. And uh, we're so excited at the caliber of talent here and uh, it's just coming together. So thanks so much. Thanks, Julia. Thanks, Rebecca. Thanks, Warren. Thanks, Gal. And uh, Thank the you. Aligned crew, we appreciate you. Thanks to all the sponsors and we'll see you manana. Bye-bye. Amazing. Thank you very much. Bye, everyone. Thank you.